The pericope of scripture that I've chosen for this evening is the fourth chapter of Proverbs. We have there Solomon's instruction to his young son, but the Holy Spirit makes that written instruction also our instruction from God. Proverbs 4. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my way. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is all darkness. They know not at what they stumble. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. And now our texts are these last three verses. Let thine eyes look right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the first eight chapters, what we have called wisdom is personified. That is, wisdom is our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And may our eyes always be on our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Needed for us is devotion. Devotion to God and his way for us. Yes, this is written by Solomon to his sons and daughters. It's the instruction that he received from his father, King David. But it's not just for young people. But every day of our lives, this calling comes to us to keep our eyes to look right on, pondering our path, establishing our way, living Living not for ourselves, not living for the world, but living for the glory of our God. And notice it all starts with a heart, a regenerated heart. For we all come into this world children of wrath, children of sin. That's all parents can bring into this world, sinful children. One of the most beautiful prayers that we have is in our baptismal form when we ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit to regenerate us, to give us life from above. From that heart are the speech of our lips. From that heart are the one opening up of our eyes and beholding things. From that heart is the activity of our hands and the ways that our feet go. May wisdom establish our ways, all our ways, by eyes that look right on. That is Proverbs 4, verse 25. Let thine eyes look right on. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Our eyes are to look right on. Notice with me in the first place the meaning. Notice second of all with me the demand. And then thirdly the requirement. Eyes to look right on the meaning. The eyes are dressed. That body part that brings to our consciousness the world around us that we live in. And our text emphasizes the eyes and the eyelids. Where are you directing your gaze day after day? In this preparatory examination, what are your eyes set upon? Is it the brand new cars that are real fancy? Is it the big houses? Is it riches in the bank? Is it your portfolio? What are you looking at? What are you taking into your consciences and then dwelling on with your mind and heart? The eyes and the eyelids that make us aware of the world that is around us, a sinful world, a world in darkness. But these eyes not only ponder and take in the world that is around us, but these eyes also look and ponder upon the path that we are traveling. Where are you headed? What are your goals? Is it the narrow and the straight way that leads to everlasting life, or is it the broad way that leads to destruction? The eyes are, as it were, a window into the soul. What are your desires? What is your willing? What is your wants? Jesus speaks about the importance of the eyes. We read in Matthew 6, verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. 
Or again in Luke 11, verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thy eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. What does it mean to have a single eye? If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Single. In other words, it is not looking all around at the things that are offered and say, I want a lot of, a little bit, can I somehow throw them together? A single eye is a figure of speech for being focused, being focused on one thing, namely the king of the king, kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, our eye upon Christ Jesus. And clear vision of that path that leads to that kingdom also takes in the things that might hinder one from that path to the kingdom. Jesus warns about that over and over in Scripture in Luke 9. Jesus warns about the plowman who is looking backwards. In this coming week, you are called, yes, to look back, examine. What path are you following? How have you wandered from it? What hindrances have there been in your life from going on that straight and that narrow way or, and deviating? But don't keep on looking back. I like to call that navel-gazing, always looking at oneself and, oh, I'm such a wretched sinner, I'm such a wretched sinner. Yeah, we're all wretched sinners, but get your eye off your navel and look up. Great is your Savior. Great is the Redeemer who gave his life on the cross for you. Those who look backward only are not fit for the kingdom. And so our eyes in our passage are to look right on. Does that sound familiar? For that's where that slang phrase comes from, right on. Shooting arrows at a target, right on target. Or maybe investing your money and you were right on and getting the right investment. Our passage talks about the eyes that are right on. And that means that there is a straight and a narrow way in our pilgrimage, and we are not to deviate from it. Keep looking on. Keep looking on at the God who chose you and redeemed you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Keep looking right on the Christ and his cross. As Paul says, I rejoice in the cross of Christ Jesus. I make my boast in the cross of Christ Jesus. Eyes that look right on to God's word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light upon our path, rise right on. And don't let your eyes deviate from that path, looking all around you. If any of you have taken a vacation or just gone maybe down for a weekend down to the Amish country, you see the horses running down the street with blinders on their eyes. In other words, they are not to be deviated away from, straight away by the cars that are coming or the people that are around looking straight on. Two weeks ago, a man from our church was taking a walk with his wife and a dog was on the leash, but all of a sudden the dog saw a rabbit over there, and so it jumped after the rabbit, pulled the leash out of the lady's hand, 
And when he couldn't find the rabbit, he went after the man and the wife from our church and did terrible damage to them in the hospital for several days. Eyes right on. I think of my wife, Alda. When I'm driving through the country and I see the cornfields growing, tassels on it, big ears of corn, I see the soybeans nice and green, I see the wheat fields already being harvested, and she will say, will you keep your eyes on the road? Many things that might deviate our eyes spiritually from the one path that we are to take. Look right on. What distracts us from that straight and that narrow way? Is it some besetting sin that you are kind of harboring in your chest and you say, I can serve God, but yes, okay, there is this sinful aspect of my life, but my, my love for the Lord and his grace that is all sufficient, it doesn't matter if I indulge in too much of the bottle or sex out of marriage or looking at other women instead of only your wife. What distractions, as you prepare to come to the table, do you need to acknowledge to the Lord that you need help to fight against? What should one do with those different distractions of the world, the temptations that bombard us? the besetting sin. And the answer is, get on your knees and lay it before the Lord in prayer. God, help me. Help me to have that single eye for the kingdom of Christ. Have that single eye for the glory of our God. Have that single eye to thy word that tells us how we have to live. You see, we are not like the folks during the period of the judges, or at least we should not be, who does whatever is right in their own eyes. By God's grace, one looks right on to Christ crucified looks right on to a life lived for him in thankfulness, looks right on to the goal of our whole life, that we may be with Jesus. In the interim state, when our body is in the ground and our soul is with Christ Jesus, but beyond the interim state, to when Christ comes again with the new heavens and the new earth and we're going to be with him forever and ever in heaven and in the new earth. Eyes looking right on. Let me give some illustrations of a wandering or of a deviating eye. Eve in the garden. The devil comes with his temptation. <clears throat> you mean you can't eat from any of these trees? Well, no, of course not, of course not. We can eat from all those trees except that one tree, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says, no. You will not surely die, says the devil, and she looks at that tree. She looks at that fruit on that tree, and it is pleasant to the eye. And she took and ate it. Deviating eye. From the word of God, the day thou eatest thereof, thou wilt surely die. She looked to the fruit her ears open to the temptation of the devil, and she wanted to be equal with God. Boys and girls, you know from Sunday school the story of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. 
How wonderful that he was able to be with Abram in his household whom God had blessed and called to be his people. But I, Lot's eyes started traveling when there was some trouble between the servants because Abraham had so many sheep and Lot had so many sheep and his eyes deviated and he saw that that grass is so rich and full down there by Sodom and Gomorrah and he goes there. And his sheep get fatter and fatter. And he gets richer and richer. And he moves closer and closer to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And finally, he's within the city with his family. He has been made one of those who sit at the gates of the city. Respected. That deviating eye, what did it cost him? Everything. Everything. He had married children that laughed at him and they stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah. And even as the angels led them out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife looks back to Sodom because that's where her heart was and she turns into a pillar of salt. And Lot goes on with his two daughters and Sodom and Gomorrah were in their hearts, and they laid with their father, and they produced the evil nations that later on were a pest to God's people. That deviating eye of righteous lot brought him trouble, misery in his life. Shall we talk about Achan? Walk around the city once each day, and on the seventh day, walk around that city seven times. And when the trumpets sound and the people shout, the walls come tumbling down. And God had warned them that the riches of that city were his, for he got the victory for them. And Achan saw the gold necklaces and the silver and some awfully nice tunics and he took them for himself. His eye deviated from the word of God, which said, it is mine, thou shalt not take it. And he and his family were stoned for their disobedience. And then there is David. David, who is becoming rather prosperous as a king, a great kingdom God has given to him so that he doesn't think he has to go out with his soldiers any longer fighting. Let them go out and fight, and he's going to sit there on his rooftop and enjoy the view, and especially enjoy the view of his neighbor's wife. He who had plenty of wives already himself he looks and he takes his neighbor's only wife. And when he cannot get his neighbor to lay with his wife after calling him back to Jerusalem, he sacrifices him in the battle to try to cover up his sin. And I taken off the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I taken away from the commandment, thou shalt not murder. Well, come on, soldiers always get killed in battle. He deviated from the way that was pleasing to the Lord as Nathan was to come. Thou art the man. Let's jump to the New Testament. Peter. Peter and the disciples there are on the Sea of Galilee fishing all night, and all of a sudden they see someone walking to them. They think it's a ghost. And when they realize that it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Peter is eager to go to his Lord, and he says, I come to you. And he got out of the boat with his eyes on Jesus. He's walking on the water until, until he took his eyes off Jesus, and he looked at those big waves and listened to their crashing, and he starts sinking. Oh, 
if we take our eyes off the right path, if we take our eyes away from Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, if we take our eyes away from the teaching of God's Word, the teaching that many of your parents taught you adults and you adults are now teaching your children and to your grandchildren. Take your eyes off the right way and you're going to fall. And so with telling us about our eyes and our eyelids looking straight before us, the demand. Verse 26, ponder the path of thy feet. That word ponder means literally make it straight. Make that ground before you, the path that you are traveling, straight or even. Open up that road to obedience, to living for Christ Jesus, seeking his glory with the goal of being with him forever and ever. That is exactly what we read in the book of Isaiah, isn't it? In Isaiah chapter 40, after we read of the comfort that comes to God's people, there is that promise. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every high hill will be made low and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And that is exactly what John the Baptist did to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus as he would establish his kingdom. He called out to the wicked Pharisees in his crowd, Woe unto you! Repent! Repent of your sins and believe for the Lamb is at hand who is going to establish the kingdom. Get rid of all those distractions, all those sins that so easily beset our path. Get rid of those. Look straight on. Those things that hinder or interfere with our serving Christ Jesus. It's not only sins. It's not only bad things. It can even be good things. If your work or if your family takes such precedence over everything else, they're a hindrance. Nothing may get in the way of your devotion or your love, your service of Christ Jesus. One is not to turn aside that is saying, okay, there are these things in my life, okay, I'll kind of try to get around them once in a while and stay in the general direction. No, remove those hindrances that get in your way that make the path difficult for you of serving Christ Jesus. That is the spiritual calling of the child of God. What are those hindrances that get in our way? Isn't it, first of all, and especially, our sinful nature? Our sinful nature where the pleasures of sin are very pleasant to our eyes like that fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was to eat. Young people, you're dating. Marriage is still off maybe a little ways because you got some college. But I know I'm going to marry her say, uh, someday, so does it really hurt if we know each other intimately now? We're going to get married eventually. You're taking your eyes off the word of God and you're saying, oh, everyone else is doing it, even in the church. I am the word of God, which is the lamp to your feet, a light upon your path. Remain celibate for God's honor and also for the good of your partner that you're hoping someday to marry. That, beloved, is the greatest hindrance to any of our walks, our sinful flesh. 
Number two, it's that world out there with its temptations. Come on and join us. That's not something new, as the Israelites were just about ready to go out into the land of Canaan. The Midianites came along because Balaam the prophet could not curse God's people, so he scratched his head. He said, I can't curse them. I'll let them do it. I'll tell the king of Midian and Moab, let your little daughters go flying around them, and when they see them, they're going to cohabit with each other, and surely then God will be so angry with his people that are fornicating that he will destroy them. This world says, join us. They don't want you to stand out different because your life contradicts their life and shows their life for the shallowness, the evil that it is. Their sinful nature. That sinful world out there that either will tempt you to join them or will persecute you. Read the voices of the martyrs. What terrible persecution brothers and sisters in so many countries today are experiencing. Unable to work, their houses burned, put into prison, or even put to death for witnessing to a Muslim neighbor. How wonderful that God gives them such strong faith that rather than denying Christ, Christ's honor and glory is more important than their life here in this world. Whatever, whatever hinders or interferes with progress in our Christian walk must be taken out of the way. taken out of the way. We read in Matthew 5, verse 29 and 30. These words. But he said, Nay, lest ye gather up the tares, root up the wheat with them, let them grow together. That's in the field. So there's wickedness all around us yet. But we are to be different. And there's some radical words that are spoken by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and you also find it in Luke's Gospel. We read there, Ye have heard it is said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her committeth adultery with her already in his heart. Young people, have you ever heard that phrase? I may always look, I just may touch. Eve should not have been looking at that fruit on that tree. God said no. You should not be looking at others, what, thinking in your mind what you could all do with them. Whoever looketh at a woman committeth adultery in his heart. Verse 29, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for them that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Jesus, again in Matthew 18, he's first talking about our hands or our feet getting us into hindrance of walking the narrow way. He says, cut them off and cast them from thee, lest ye be cast into eternal fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the hell fire. We have symbolic language here. It's not a call to self-mutilation because self-mutilation cannot cause sin to stop in the heart. But rather we have then cast, take out that eye, cast it away. We have a figure of speech for taking serious 
and costly action to kill sin. Sexual lust will condemn a man to eternal damnation unless it is truly repented of. We read in Colossians 3, verse 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify those things. Don't try to dart around them. Recognize them for what they are. Deal with it by the grace of God. Put it away from yourself. So ponder your path. Make it level straight, going to the glory of God, the cross of Christ Jesus, and the goal, heaven. We read then in verse 26, let thy ways be established. There is that kind of walk that is not distracted or hindered by evil. And what is that kind of walk? We have it in verses 11 through 13 of this chapter. Solomon says, and now the Holy Spirit says to us, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Don't do what's right in your own eyes. But with the word of God that is a light to your feet, a lamp upon your path, look to God's word. Scripture. Looking to Christ Jesus, your Savior. Looking to the life that he's going to give you in the new heavens and the new earth. Let thy ways be established. There's only one way I want to walk. Not the easy way, the broad way, with the pleasures of the world, but the narrow, the difficult way, denying self, serving Christ Jesus. What is the significance, beloved, of this preparatory message? There are many great difficulties and trials in your and my life. And when those trials and difficulties come, perhaps we get angry. We say, this isn't fair that God laid me on this bed of illness. This isn't fair that my loved one was taken away from me. There are so many people that say, once they served God, but when these troubles came in their life, what good was God to them? God is good. God is wise. Will I understand all of God's ways? No, they're way past my puny little mind. God is wise. God is good. And he says, this is the way. Walk in it. Deal with the things that interfere with your life. Don't simply ignore them. I'll tell you a story. I had a young lady who loved a young man. Oh, they loved each other so much that they really didn't want to bring up the issue of what church are we going to go to? Our Protestant Reformed churches or this other church that her boyfriend went to once in a while with his dad and mother and they do nothing about it. They didn't want to deal with it. Let's postpone that. We'll deal with that once we're married. The young girl was sure that he loved her so much that he'd come with her to his, her church. And not. She's going to her church. He's still going once in a while to his church. What anguish in their life because they postponed that hindrance that could be laying there in their path of a happy marriage. I, by nature, am a procrastinator. What do we read about those that 
don't pay attention to those things that are standing in our way. And the answer is, we read in Matthew 13, verse 15, their eyes have they closed. It's like that little thing about the monkeys closing their eyes and closing their ears so they don't, aren't aware of things. I'll deal with it later. Somehow it'll all come out in the wash. By grace, we need to deal with those things that hinder us from running in the way to godliness, a way of serving Christ Jesus, seeking the glory of our God. We have to deal with those things in a scriptural manner. Get rid of them. Cast them away from thee, lest you end up in the lake of fire in hell. Do it in a timely manner. Notice with me, thirdly, then, the requirement negatively, don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. What does that mean? We usually talk about the right and the left, don't we? The conservative right and the liberal left. And then some would like to be neutral somehow, kind of both of them. But there's no being neutral here. It's not talking about conservatives or liberals, but rather the right and the left is a departure from the way before you that leads to life eternal. It's departure. One, when, when one looks right on, then he or she does not turn aside to the pleasures there the temptations there, the sin here, the sin there. And that heart, when we find those besetting sins there, desiring to be satisfied, we say no, because saying yes to Christ Jesus means saying no to sin, to self, to Satan, to the world. What does this mean for you and me tonight? in this coming week, and for all of our life. It does not mean self-confidence. Okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'll do it. Not self-reliance. No. Self-discipline. Self-discipline. I know what God's Word says. I know what my sinful flesh says. I know what the world's saying. I know what the world, the devil is tempting. No! I must serve Jesus. Joseph, taken away from his family, there in prison for doing a good job in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife wants to take him to bed with her. And he says, no, how can I do this against my God? Seek that which is proper. And that's why Solomon says to his son, wisdom, that is the Holy Spirit, says to us, let all thy ways be established. In your minds now, in your hearts, I am going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to glorify God with my life here in this world. I've got my eye on the goal, the new heavens and the new earth where there's no more sin or temptation, no more sickness or pain or sorrow or death. The calling, Philippians chapter 2, work out your calling and your election with fear and with trembling, God working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. That calls for self-discipline, straightforward, unswerving direction to that fixed goal that God has set before us. What does this mean now positively in our life as we examine ourselves? Do I love the Lord and do I seek to honor and to glorify him in all that I do? 
whether it be in my single life, whether it be in my married life, whether it be in my work or whether it be in my play, whether it be at school, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in my neighborhood, we are being taught in the way of faithfulness, always seeking to glorify our God. For in the way of that faithfulness to his word, we will enjoy his favor. But in the way of disobedience, we will experience his wrath. Isaiah, wrath for a little moment because of our sins. We are able to keep that eye looking right on because of the grace of redemption. God has given us new hearts. God forgives us all of our sins, and he has delivered us from the bondage of sin. We're not slaves of sin any longer. We've been set free to serve our God. Psalm 25, verse 15, mine eyes, says the psalmist, are ever toward the Lord. Psalm 121, verse 1, I will lift up mine eyes from the hills. I'm not going to do it on my own power, but there comes my help. Job 19, verse 27. Job says, Mine eyes shall behold and not another. That's the goal. One day we're going to, now by faith we see Christ Jesus crucified, but one day we will see him face to face. Jesus is coming again. And we read in Revelation 1, verse 7, every eye will see him, but will it be with the eye of joy because we are his precious bride who served him? Or will it be the eyes of those who are going to call for the mountains to fall upon them because they have walked in wickedness? Beloved in the Lord Jesus. Not self-confidence, not self-reliance, self-discipline, looking to the Lord Jesus and his grace to lead you on. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy precious word. A precious word that a father passes on to his children. A precious word that our heavenly father passes on to us who are his sons and daughters and servants and friends. Of ourselves, Father, we are sinful. The temptations are many. O oh Lord, lead us on. Hold us by thine hand. Let thy word shed light to our path so we say no to all the sin and the hindrances that come in our life that we may walk joyfully with our God to please him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.